Alamos director ready for firing circuit. 30 seconds before age hour. Cameras are ready aboard ship and in the sky. Two, one, fire. This is the power of the atom. Just a few years before this, in March 1940, an article was published that changed the world forever. Here's how it started. The attached detailed report concerns the possibility of constructing a super bomb which utilizes the energy stored in atomic nuclei as a source of energy. The energy liberated in the explosion of such a superbomb is about the same as that produced by the explosion of 1,000 tons of dynamite. This energy is liberated in a small volume in which it will, for an instant, produce a temperature comparable to that in the interior of the sun. The blast from such an explosion would destroy life in a wide area. The size of this area is difficult to estimate, but it will probably cover the center of a big city. This report, written by two German-Jewish refugees in Britain by the names of Otto Robert Frisch and Rudolf Payels, also detailed how such a superbomb could be made, and explained how only around a pound or half a kilogram of uranium would be needed to make it. One small particle burst into this staggering energy. Temperature at the explosion center is perhaps 100 million degrees Fahrenheit. The terrific pressure caused winds up to approximately 1,000 miles per hour. The radioactive vapor and debris rose to five miles and lasted an hour before dispersing. How did we get to this point? How did science go from the discovery of the atom to unleashing its full power, inevitably dragging us into the atomic age where we find ourselves today? To answer that, we need to go back in time, way back. In ancient times, people reverenced the sun as the god of health, sending life to earth dwellers. Amazingly, the idea of the atom was first put forward around two and a half thousand years ago. In the 5th century BC, the Greek philosopher Leucippus and his more famous student Democritus proposed that the universe consists of two fundamental constituents, the void, or nothingness, and tiny, solid, indestructible particles that cannot be broken down any further. They called these particles atomos, meaning indivisible. Democritus wrote that atoms and void are the only things that actually exist and that all other things are only said to exist by social convention. To illustrate this, imagine you're looking at a mountain made of trillions of specks of dust. Now, is that actually a mountain that you see or is that just what we as a society would call it? Is it in fact just dust in a specific shape that we're giving the name mountain? Can we even say with certainty that the mountain truly exists, or is it just the dust that exists? The theory went that atoms were too small for humans to see, but they had different sizes and different shapes. They were infinite in number and had always existed. They could also combine together due to hooks or eyes on their surfaces, for example. The combination of different types of atoms gives rise to the different forms of matter we see all around us. The theory was most poetically summarized a few centuries later by the Roman philosopher Lucretius, who wrote De Rerum Natura, or On the Nature of Things. He described how harder solids were composed of more hooked atoms to allow them to connect together more strongly, and how liquids were composed of smoother atoms which could move over each other. He also described how pleasant flavors were caused by rounder atoms passing over the tongue, and how bitterness was caused by more crooked atoms. Combining these phenomena, he said that seawater was composed of smooth atoms to give it its fluidity, and some rough ones mixed in to give it its bitter taste. Now, there was no empirical evidence for any of this, just philosophical thought. However, tiny particles of different sizes that make up matter, bonds forming between those particles which can have different strengths, different combinations of atoms forming different substances, it's amazing how much they got right just by logical reasoning alone. The philosophy became known as atomism, and millennia later it was still supported by the founder of modern chemistry, Robert Boyle, and by the founder of classical physics, Sir Isaac Newton. But not everybody accepted the idea since there wasn't any actual evidence for any of it. 